Hello everybody, my name is Elia Rudkin and welcome to part 5 of my series of videos on how I make my mountain bike videos and in particular how I made Doug's Trail. Now, if you have been following me in this series of videos from the beginning, I showed you the equipment I used out on the trails. That was in part one, along with some of the filming techniques. In parts two and four, I showed you how and why I prepare the semi real footage taken from the various cameras and get it all ready into a state before importing it into Final Cut Pro. Why do I prepare semi real footage? saves a lot of disk space and speeds up the editing when all that footage is brought into the editor. Well, not all that footage. I removed a lot of the surplus footage and put it in some kind of logical order. Now, I've been editing films now for five years, learn how to create this workflow. It reduces the time spent doing needless background rendering, allowing more time actually editing the film instead of waiting for effects to be applied each and every time you make a small tweak to that video. Basically, I leave all the addition of effects and color lots to the end of the editing process. So in this episode, I will show you how my workflow develops in Final Cut Pro using the semi-raw footage we prepared earlier. So the first stage in this workflow is obviously to create a Final Cut Pro project or what they call library. So let's do that first and then populate it with the folders and we move on to the first part of the workflow which is then importing the semi-raw footage. So on creating a Final Cut Pro project we get presented with a blank project I've already called it Doug's Trail and we get two event folders one smart collection and one with a date in it and then we just rename this to raw and then I populate the new project with new folders so I've got sound effects, b-roll, project, music sound effects, intro, raw, 360. And that just about counts for the majority of folders I would use in my project. Now for the project itself, project, I just use the existing project name. And as you can see here, I export to 180p resolution and keep it at 30 frames per second, Apple ProRes 422. So what is my workflow editing strategy? My primary strategy is to lay out the video in a complete rough sequence by taking three to six second sections of clips from the semi raw footage and dropping it into the timeline. Whilst I am dropping the clips into the timeline, I'm purposely resisting applying any kinds of effects or doing any fine editing or removing of any artifacts at this stage that would distract a viewer. We leave this to later in the workflow. It may be the case that you're bringing into the timeline stuff that you think you may not need or don't want. But basically what we're trying to do at this stage is lay the clips out in the order that we want them to create our storyline. That doesn't mean to say that when I'm laying out these clips in the timeline, I don't move clips around. Maybe I've made some mistakes. I've got clips in the wrong order or I named them wrong. Or I've just changed my mind. There's no hard and fast rule here. By going through the timeline, dropping these clips in is another opportunity to separate any footage you might have identified as B-roll. So, populated the project with some folders, we now import the semi-raw footage. So here we see the original footage from the original film, and this is top directory, and in here you can see here all the prepared semi-raw footage for that film, and you can see yeah, it's all ordered into groups. So I've got 36 clips here. I have here the 360 degree footage. So choosing the raw folder and choose all the GoPro footage and drop that in. And that brings in all those clips. And as you can see, they're all in the order, ready to be dropped into the timeline. Now we do the same with the 360 degree footage, choosing the 360 degree raw folder. There you go. So now in the background, these are rendered into ProRes. That is first stage in the workflow, import the semi-raw footage. So what do I do next? 
take those semi-raw footage clips, take three to five seconds out of each one and build the timeline. So here we can see semi-raw footage, 1A, 1AB. Here, this is the start as I drop in, just drop in the video, go around there and come back around the thing. So I like that, take three seconds, drop that in line, expand that up, take the next clip as we come out the other side of that berm and drop that into the timeline. Already is like a transition there. I don't necessarily like that tree. So just quickly take that back. So I've got one second. And we take the next clip, come out the other side of that tree. And we disappear out of the camera. So you can see how already the semi raw footage is working for us. And there we go. So we've got the first little bit. Now the next one coming through, coming down the way into the next feature. So this must be a joining scene. So I'm going to take that in, trim that down just a fraction. Almost two seconds long. So there we get a transition from that mountain bike trail feature through the woods. And we come into the next feature. I'm going to take this, jumped over something, so I like that. Maybe just quickly trim that off. A bit of dust there, I want to keep that for a moment. We've got some sound here too, we may want to use this later. Got another camera there, something like that. Maybe put that one before. Come around, drop in, drop in. And we should have one now out the other side. Let me finish there. So if I bring that one together. Let this render out. There you go. So if we skim through there, we've got something we can work with already. So that's basically the pattern. Go through the semi-raw footage, drop in the clips, maybe reel them in a few places, and we can form that timeline very, very, very quickly. Okay, so there's an example of dropping the semi-raw clips into the timeline and forming your timeline through the sequence. Now to beat things up a little. I've taken the original Dog's Trail video project, slowly progressed that in this video. So with that in mind, here is Dog's Trail's project. These are the folders or events for the project. As you can see here, the same setup of mainstream graphics, intro, music, raw, there's the B-roll, GoPro and GoPro Karma. So if I open up this project, which I've pre-edited for the next example in this demonstration, is I have taken all the clips in the raw footage up here. And you can see here all the clips highlighted by yellow boxes dropped into the timeline. And if we skim through that, you can see is the footage from that film. But what it doesn't have in here at the moment is all the other bits and pieces like B-roll, soundtracks, sound effects. And we go on to those in a moment. So, okay, we have the first version of the timeline laid out. And now this is an opportunity where in the workflow, I start inserting just blank gaps to break up the timeline into sections. I mean, these blank gaps, three second gaps, won't be in the output video, but just help me when I'm moving around the timeline, zooming in and out on that timeline, I can see where I am and where sections end. Another technique I use is to take the clips maybe from a particular scene and group them using Final Cut's groups feature and that way I can give them a name and it's all summarized as one big clip as against a lot of little clips. Now probably some of you out there are wondering what's happened to the 360 degree footage? Where is that in the timeline? Well, I've left it until now to start selecting those clips because the work involved in taking the 360 degree footage is a little bit more involved than just dropping in those sections from the normal video. This is because, as you've seen in my previous videos, I convert my 360 degree footage into a flat rectangle format. And so I want it to look as much like a regular camera as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, I do like 300 degree footage. I think it can be very cool, but sometimes I don't think it's appropriate to put tiny planets and stuff into some of my videos. 
most of my time I'm taking 360 degree footage, inverting it into normal camera footage. Now, because I want to get normal footage from the 360 degree film, I want to take the clip and choose how the camera moves over time through the scene to follow the subject. This means I have to place 3D camera waypoints in the timeline to move and orientate the camera viewport so that it looks at parts of the 360 degree scene that I want. Since this is more involved than just dropping a normal clip into the timeline, I want to make sure I don't waste time editing the wrong footage. Also, now that the 360 degree footage is inside Final Cut Pro, it has been converted to 5.7K ProRes format, and these are particularly large files, and it can make the computer work pretty hard each and every time I move one of those camera waypoints. This again is why I said earlier I do not apply any effects until later in the video. If I applied any effects here at this stage this would make the computer work even harder as it applies those effects on each and every change. Now here's an example of 360 degree footage prepared for the timeline now that we have the rest of the sequence ready. This video footage is on a three meter pole. This is where we drop into the scene. And you can see it's quite weird when you look at it drop back into the timeline. As you can see, I can't see much. This is because the viewport is set at a particular position. So if I go onto here, I can move the camera around. And there is Vida with the three meter pole. And there is me coming down the hill. And so what I want to do now is keyframe this such that when I come down the hill, the camera can move I am. So if I bring up the inspector, see here 360 degree orientation and transform. For this particular clip, we do not want the transform, so I just switch this off. Now I'll manipulate these tilt, pan, and roll keyframes for the 360 degree camera. So if I just click on these just as an initial point, making sure that I am at the beginning of the clip, if I go through the clip, go out of view, I found the best technique is now to just move the camera roughly to where I am. Final Cut Pro Ultra actually forms some new key points that will follow through. Give it a few seconds, pan round, see where I am again, there I am. Now, what I can do is go back to these keyframes and bring them down the way. I've set up three keyframes for this camera. You can see it doesn't work perfectly at the moment. I'm spinning around on the spot. So let's fix this one first. So if we add in another keyframe here, by just moving the camera. So as you can see, as I move this and let it go, it's re-rendering the clip every time. And so even on this computer, it takes a little bit of time to sort that out. So that's working, that's coming around. Just out of view, but maybe that adds to, to the effect of going in and out of view. There's me coming down the hill, going around. Now you can spend quite a bit of time fine tuning that. But I think you get the principle of what I'm trying to achieve here by manipulating the tilt, pan and roll at certain points in the clip timeline. I can move the viewport so I can follow the rider. Okay, so that was a quick example of setting up a 3D camera through the scene. I'm just going to do one more, and this one's a little bit more complicated, but hopefully you'll get the idea what we need to do from the previous one. So using three meter pole, I use the wheel cam. So let's go and find a wheel cam bit of clip. This one. So you can see there, if I drop this into the timeline, and for the sake of this exercise, I'm just going to drop it next door. Now it looks particularly different. So if I zoom out, change the field of view, even though it's distorted, I do get to see everything. Here I can see the camera. And for this one, I'm mostly in the frame. But what I can do here, I just want maybe want to change the angle a little bit over to point out of the way of me. Don't worry about the remote controller at the moment. We shall remove my wife later as she is an artifact. So leave it there. Hit the keyframe, source that point. Go to here. And we want to start to move the camera around. So we Click waypoint. Do that, so it exaggerates the hill a little bit. And there we go. 
So if I change the viewport now to just in view, let that render out. And see what we have. So all in all, I think that's pretty good. And you see, you get the idea that if you can keyframe the camera movement as you follow the rider, you can create some quite dramatic effects. And it looks like it was just done with a warring camera. The only thing we would have to do at a later stage, if it is really quite distracting, is to fix the bend in the trees. Okay, so we're now at step four in the workflow. And that means sounds, music track. There's several ways to do this. The first is the easy one is just to go out there and choose a music track and just drop it straight in. And there you go and move on to your next part of your editing. But for me, I take a particular soundtrack. I'm looking for beats or cuts in the music to sync the video to the music. So having found a track, I need to find clips that fit that beat. This is where I start tightening up the timeline to the music track. If I had done that earlier, I would have had to undo all that work to only now reapply it to fit the soundtrack. Now moving those clips around, like your clips may not fit the music. So this is an opportunity now to start using some of your B-roll footage because by just dropping those in, you can move the timeline along to match a new beat. So being quite clever with any B-roll footage while setting the scene, setting the context of the viewer, it allows you to manipulate the timeline in more ways and so giving you more options. Now, another part of sound design besides the sound crack is bring in sound effects. It may be that there is sound that is damaged or it has a sound in there I do not want, like a voice or a click or a bang. The GoPro cameras, which as you know, are not particularly good at picking up sound. I can even just attenuate that out. If it's too involved, maybe I just cover it up with a sound effect. The third one, which is even harder to remove, is to somehow remove the sound completely. And this is where I may go to another part of the video sequence and pick out a sound which I think closely matches the damaged soundtrack and just simply replace it. And I can do this in two ways. Is I use the Sennheiser Hero 4 camera soundtrack and drop that into a purpose MSI's mountain bike, tires traveling over the ground, wind rush, or I may want to take B-roll sound effects and put them into the timeline and make it a little bit more exciting for the viewer. Here is the project again, and here is the timeline. We've lined up all the clips in the order that we want them. We're quite happy with that. We have a few odd camera sounds in there. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. And now what we want to do, we have to line up those beat with the transition in the clips. So if I switch on music soundtrack and you just ignore the clips for a moment and try and listen to the beats of the music. So as you can hear, there's a definite beat about every second in the soundtrack. But what I would do now is I would try and line up the changing clips at those beats. And this is what we're going to try and do. So having expanded the timeline, look very carefully that there, 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 there. So if we go to the first one, you can see if I expand this up, you can see there's a transition just here, here, and here. So if we just play that again. So after a while, with a little bit of practice, and depending on the soundtrack that you've brought in, you can spot those beats. Now, if they're not too close together, say at least a second apart, most tracks can go between a second and two seconds. That works nicely to add that speed and energy to the video. Any shorter than that, and people can't see what's in the clip. So what you could do if that's the situation, is you can go every two beats or every three beats. So it depends on the soundtrack. There's no hard, fast rules here, but just choose one where you think it works and allows the viewer to see enough for them to follow the rider and be picked up on the soundtrack as it plays through. Now you might see here, that the beat sound is just before each clip. We want to try and do this because this is what we want, that J and L effect, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where you just want to bring that in 
before the clip changes. And so we do that all the way down the soundtrack. So here, we've got one. It looks like it's too much, but if you keep looking at the video, it works. And we have another one here. And after a while, the soundtrack might change. So I think somewhere down here, let's have a listen. So we've got a bit more in here. And here is an, a good example of the beat becoming much more rapid. And by choosing the appropriate clips for that point in the soundtrack, you can really add energy to what would be an otherwise quite normal ride through. So even though I've sequenced all my clips, I've identified this point in the music track, which is really quite energetic. I've brought together clips from around there and made me move clips somewhere else to make this work for that particular set of clips. So you can change the order. I mean, your viewer doesn't necessarily know the trail that you've been riding, so you can change it to any order that you want. So I start off in the order that I filmed it, and then I'm left myself the freedom to move all that around. I also use this stage, look at opportunities to see how sound flows from one clip to another clip. And you may have noticed in films, and you can hear the sound before you visit the video clip. And this is what they call J and L trimming. So you take the audio from the clip that you do want and you separate it out and then trim it. So it starts just before, like half a second before the clip starts. That way you get that nice transition to a clip and it stops the jarring of a sound suddenly just changing. And the same, you can use the same at the end of a clip, the L transition, where you can let a sound bleed out from a clip after that clip has finished. The next stage handling sound is adding in those extra sound effects, that B-roll footage sound effects. So again, using the clip that we just saw, I've disabled the music track, and what we're going to do is just slowly introduce the sound effects to help emphasize some of the movement through the video. We've disabled the soundtrack. As you can see here, this is the original footage. And for the sake of this video, the sound here was not of much use to me. And in the 360 video, that is certainly no use to me. So of course it's silent. So what I do is I go through the video and find bits of sound. So if I emphasize this and bring this back in, I bring in another sound effect. And that works. And I bring in another sound effect. Bring in another sound effect. And you can see here the J and L effect. So I brought in this soundtrack before the clip starts, before this clip starts. And I've allowed this particular soundtrack to bleed into the next soundtrack. And what I could have probably done is attenuated. So one feeds in and one bleeds out. One bleeds in. And here I may have used the soundtrack across multiple clips because either this one wasn't very good or it didn't flow between that one and that one or they just didn't flow together. So I've just basically taken one soundtrack and used it across multiple clips. So I've got the background sounds of the person moving through the scene and with the music enabled now we have... So it takes a little bit of time, but once you bring all that together, a really quite rubbish initial soundtrack from the GoPros can be transformed into something really quite good. You can get away with using that sound effect many times in the video. So now we have a timeline where it's tightened up against the soundtrack. We have some sound effects added in, maybe some bad noise taken out. We're happy with what we've got. But maybe in those clips, there are artifacts that you want removed. This is where I start removing those artifacts. Now, an artifact could be cameras, buildings, people, or just plain mistakes. And so this is an opportunity now, having fixed the footage, as it were, I can then spend the time digitally editing the footage such that I can remove the artifacts. And so take any of those distractions away from the viewer. Now, one word of warning here, Removing artifacts from the footage can be a quite difficult thing to do, if not impossible. So when out on the scene, taking 
footage, I do recommend you have a look around, see if you can position the camera such or remove stuff from the scene that you do not want in there. And when you do try, you can actually make it even worse and even more distracting for the viewer. So hopefully these are a few tips that you can go away with and you can use. Now one particular thing that I have found in the past is quite useful. If you know I drop the camera down, run away, then do some bike riding, ride past, pick up the camera. Is footage that I would normally throw away at the beginning and end can be quite useful to clean away artifacts. Now in this particular example, I'm going to be removing the cameraman. We have a lot of what we call dead footage at the front and the end of the useful bit of clip. I found if I use that, cut some of that out, I can then paste it over the top of the artifact, make, the, make it look like it was never there in the first place. So here is an example of that. Here I have this clip where we're setting up the scene and I just run my cursor over it just to show what we're trying to do here. We've just moved away from the camera, set on the scene, and we're setting up another camera position here. And you can see it's quite a few seconds here, right? We're going through, we're ready to go. The rider's coming through and the only useful bit is about here which is that yellow box out of all of that. But as you can see in the video, I do not want to have the cameraman obviously in the scene. So what I do is I find a bit of the scene where, in this case, the cameraman is not in that point in the screen and I mask it out. So here is an example, I've taken a clip of film and I've cut it out. If I take, switch that off and switch this back on again, you can see the cameraman in the scene. But if I switch this on, the cameraman disappears, and that's quite an easy thing to do. Providing, obviously, the rider doesn't ride in front of that particular artifact, then, then it's a different ball game. So here is an example of where I've got one of the cameras in the scene, and I want to remove that camera from the scene. In this particular clip, I don't know if you can notice, there is no camera over here. But if you go over to the raw clip, there is a camera just here. Now in this particular case, maybe you wouldn't have noticed it because the ride is riding past and that's what the viewer is looking at. And you can use that to your advantage, but you can bet your bottom dollar or someone will notice this in the scene. So what we can do, we can do two things here. I could scale this clip up, in which case I just zoom in to the rider. But if I do that, I might scale it up so far that it starts to pixelate. So in order not to lose the quality, I use a plugin. If I switch off Object Remover, if you can see here, here's the camera, it is gone. How do I do this? Well, this is a plugin I bought, and what it does is it clones, say, this area here, and pastes it over the top of the artifact. Now, with some careful manipulation and strategic moving, you can animate that clone patch as it moves through the scene. Now, if it's stationary, that's a hell of a lot easier. They crank the patch over the artifact. As the artifact moves through the scene, effectively it's covered up as you go through the scene. So this is why sometimes, with a little bit of pre-planning, I'm not too worried about what cameras I would be recording in the scene, because I can use this plugin, the object remover, and remove the camera after the fact. So we've now reached the stage in the workflow where we can start applying color correction and color fixes. So what do I mean by color fixing? Color fixing is where we balance the colors across the clips from the different cameras. Now, for any of you who've used two or more GoPro cameras, getting the same recording out of them can be a hit and miss affair. This is particularly the case for me because I just plonk my cameras on the ground and hope for the best. Maybe that the sun pointing in the direction of the lens causing overexposure and other things like that. So I do have to spend time at this stage to make sure there's that consistency across the clips and not so distracting for the viewer. It's also at this stage I have to, if you like, fix the setting from the GoPro cameras. Because in part one, as you may have seen already, I set all my GoPros to use black color and a pretty low exposure. And with the 360 degree camera, that is using a logarithmic color scale. And this is the only time we have methodically use a color LUT. And by applying that LUT, it really makes those colors pop back out again. Now the thing to note here is when I do this color correction, I do not use Final Cut Pro's color balancing edition. I have found that to be a rather hit and miss affair when blatantly just set across the all clips in the scene. 
some clips come out well some clips come out really badly and you end up having to go back through it all again so how do i do this color correction well again i go through every single clip in every single scene and individually balance the color saturation and the color rgb and where i see skin tones i individually set that too once i'm happy with that i've done that through a section of the video i then look at seeing if i can match the color from individual cameras so they are consistent choose a color from one clip and then apply it to another clip so hopefully bring those two clips from two different cameras to look the same as though they came from one camera again this is a rather hit and miss affair and you can spend a lot of time here and it doesn't always work having gone through the whole timeline again and done, doing all that color correction do i apply any color lights well rarely i do find that when i done all this just bringing all those color levels back to within limits my footage looks fine and so i rarely apply additional color lots to the film now conveniently we're after a point in the scene where i can demonstrate to you color balancing and color saturation now you may have noticed as i was transitioning between the raw and the clip in the scene the color changed this is where i've done some color balancing and color correction if we look at the original footage you can see it's quite flat and a lot of exposure there. So if I look at the clip in the timeline, you can see a lot more color in there and it looks a lot better. So what have I done here? Well, let's give an example. I will move this clip and make a copy next door. It will render in and you can see it's the same for all the GoPro cameras that I have. I correct that by going to here. I switch on view scopes, go to here go to waveform and go to luma parade as you can see here in the luma scope i'm off the top of the 100 percent so i need to bring this down and then way off the bottom so basically i need to move this waveform between 0 and 100. i do this by first going to the exposure and i just move this down below just scan through to make sure nothing peaks above and move the bottom of the picture down now already you can see in the picture it's quite rich compared to what it was before and then i adjust the mid-tones or what some people call gamma and you can bring this down or up this can vary between each clip and this is why i go through every clip because depending like where the brightness is in the scene this can greatly affect and vary quite a lot so you can't do a blanket color correction you have to go through every single clip in this case i'm quite happy with that now there's no skin tones in here to correct saturation i don't normally touch that but you can see here it making my shirt go a little bit more orange I'll use that there and with color correction this is where people would do some color grading and so if it's just for the example i move the mid-tone one around so i may touch this if i have to but this is after i've corrected the exposure and had a look at the saturation once i'm happy with that i give it another quick run through because what happens sometimes is these waveforms you may correct it at one point and later on down the slip it will move and overflow it again green is a good color to judge but you can keyframe the exposure back up and then as i move out of the way it comes really bright again so i'll have to adjust the exposure back down again so you can keyframe any of these color parameters saturation parameters exposure parameters for each clip so there's an example of doing some color correction now you can copy those color parameters and apply them to another clip i do recommend you do that because it makes the start position a lot quicker to then set up and edit but you must go through and recheck to make sure for that particular clip those new color parameters actually do work Sound correction, I hear you say, but you've already done sound design. Well, yes and no. This is one of my final stages in the workflow where again, I go through every single clip and just check the sound. Just to make sure there's no voices in there, clicks, bangs. Use this as a stage to try and remove or clean that up. Most of the time, if I find a clip with sound I do not want, I just attenuate it at that point. If I can't do that, I replace that particular clip soundtrack with a section of a soundtrack from another clip, if I can find one. And this is where the B-roll footage collection comes in use because to the viewer, a bike sounds like a bike most of the time. And so you can fix bad sound with good sound from your B-roll footage. So with all that done, we've now reached one of the final stages in my workflow. And that's looking through all the clips 
and seeing where we can apply the Ken Burns effect. Now here is an example of applying the Ken Burns effect. In the timeline, I have seen where I put the camera up quite far away. If we look at the original scene here, you can see for the same scene, the camera doesn't move. So what we've done, we've added this digital dolly effect to make it look like the cameraman was following the rider. Now how did we do that? I think to crop Ken Burns. And you can see here, there's a start frame transition. And if you click on the end, end transition. So within the 2.7K resolution of the film, I have chosen this frame to be the start and this position to be the end. And when you go done, you see how it brings the picture in. It's effectively zoomed in, creates this digital dolly effect. Now to emphasize this a little bit more, if I go to this particular clip, you can see the rider riding past at speed. But what we would like here is the camera follow the rider at speed. Of course, the camera is stationary on the ground. So if we go to here, click on the Ken Burns, we can see this is the start frame and position of the viewport relative to that frame. And this is a bit more movement here. You can see the difference between start and end, start and end. Now you can resize these. So effectively you're zooming in. Or you can, but the more you zoom in, you have to be careful you don't pixelate the film. Okay, done. Then you can see here the camera looks like it was following the rider, which in fact it wasn't. We've just added that in as a digital effect. I work through the video and seeing where it is appropriate to add the Ken Burns effect. Okay, that's it. That's end of part five. If you stayed with me this far, thank you very much. If you want to catch more in this series, please subscribe. And if you did like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Now, if you have any comments or questions, please add them in the comments below, and I will go through and answer them as best as I can. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope you will join me in future videos in this series. There's plenty more to come. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Catch up with you guys later.